I made a rookie mistake at the end of the children's message. If you are ages two to five, you may uh, go to children's church if you would like. So parents, if you'd like to release your child uh, into the hands of others uh, for children's church, you are welcome to do that at this time. Maybe they all already figured that out. I'm sure we've all had those experiences in life where it's just something that you will never forget. And I had one of those that I'd like to share with you. It was my first year at the seminary in St. Louis, and the pastor from my home congregation asked if I would preach on the Sunday after Christmas while I was home on Christmas break. It was an honor to be asked, and it would be the first time that I would have preached at my home congregation, the congregation where I grew up. I can remember that Sunday like it was yesterday. The practice at that church was that the worship service began with a processional hymn, and so the pastor and I were standing at the back as the organist introduced the music for that first hymn. And while we were standing there, the pastor leaned over to me and he said, Dennis, look, I see there in the congregation the district president for our church and and his wife, who is here this morning. He's a member of our church, travels a lot, and generally isn't here, but he's here to hear your first sermon today. (laughs) Oh, and look over there, the Four retired pastors who are members of our congregation are also here this morning. They're here to hear your first sermon today. I can remember that about at that point, it was all I could do to keep from running out the back door of the church. But right at that point, the congregation started to sing the first verse of that hymn, and there was no turning back. But we were halfway down that center aisle, and the pastor leaned over next to me, and he said, Dennis, don't worry about any of them. They all put their pants on the same way you do every day. I can remember that Sunday like it was yesterday. I don't remember what the sermon was about. (laughs) I don't remember if it went well or if it was a flop. I don't remember any comments that people mention on the way out of church, good or not so good. The only thing I remember is feeling intimidated in the presence of some people that I thought were pretty great in my eyes, that I aspired to be like one day. Greatness. What is greatness? And what does it mean to be great? I think it's natural for all of us, isn't it? We all want to be great at whatever we do. When we have children, we want our children to think we're a great mom or dad, or later in life, to think we're a great grandmother or grandfather. When we get married, we want our spouse to think we're a great husband or wife. When we start a new job, we want to be a great employee. We want to be a great friend, a great neighbor, a great church member. We want to become a part, we want to be a member of a great church like we are here at St. Michael, right? Can I have an amen? Amen. Can I have a little louder amen? amen? That's what I'm looking for. Whatever team we're on, we want our team to be great. And we want others on the team to think, that we're a pretty great player too. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be great at whatever we do, but what does it really mean to be great? I think today's reading from Mark chapter 9 and 10 helps us see what greatness is and what it isn't. First, what it isn't. Now, let me remind you of some things that happened before where our reading started this morning in Mark chapter 9. Just before this, Jesus took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up on a mountain where Jesus was transfigured in front of them. 
the act of transfiguration meant that Jesus' appearance became radiant. While they were up on that mountain, the disciples literally saw and heard the Old Testament characters of Moses and Elijah up on that mountain. As they were up on that mountain, they heard the very voice of God the Father affirming Jesus as his son and for them to listen to him. Now, if you can, try to imagine what an incredible experience that must have been for these disciples. But that's not all. As they come down that mountain, Jesus is approached by a father who begs Jesus to relieve his son of an evil spirit. And so Jesus takes pity on the boy and heals him. It's now at this point that we pick up where our reading started this morning. You see, it was after witnessing the transfiguration of Jesus. It was after witnessing this miraculous healing of this young boy that the, Jesus and the disciples start to head to Jerusalem. And as they walk to Jerusalem, Jesus says this, The Son of Man will be betrayed and delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise again. Now, upon hearing those words, there doesn't seem to be any real reaction from the disciples, at least none that is recorded here. And so I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of odd, isn't it? You see, if someone you had a close relationship with, like the disciples had with Jesus, if someone you had a close relationship with just told you that all of this was going to happen to them, wouldn't you sit up and take notice? Wouldn't your focus immediately turn towards that other person? Wouldn't you at least express some level of concern for the one who just said their life would be killed? It doesn't seem like the disciples showed any response at all. Instead, apparently, the disciples start to argue with one another, which is why Jesus asked them the question, what was it you were arguing about as you walked along the road? But notice, they don't answer the question. And the reason they don't answer their question is because they didn't want Jesus to know that they were arguing with each other about which one of them was the greatest. Really? Which one of them is the greatest? Here they just witnessed the transfigured appearance of Jesus. They saw Moses and Elijah on that mountain. They heard the voice of God up there. They came down the mountain and they witnessed Jesus bringing healing to a young man. Jesus goes on to announce that he will suffer and die and on the third day rise again. And yet the disciples are arguing with each other as to which one of them is the greatest. Doesn't that seem odd? But if all of that isn't bad enough, we go on to read in chapter 10 of Mark that it wasn't long after this that two of the disciples, James and John, come to Jesus and make this request. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Wow. Wow. Sounds kind of bold, doesn't it? Actually, I think it's worth pointing out here that if you go back and look at Matthew's account of this story, Matthew describes that it was actually the mother of James and John who made this request. It was their mother who said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other on your left as you come into his kingdom. Now, I don't know if it makes it better or worse that mom made the request or not. But either way, the request was for positions of honor. And so it's no wonder that Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. 
can you drink the cup that I am to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am going to be baptized with? Now, maybe it's helpful for us to realize that the word cup there can also be translated as experience. So in other words, Jesus is asking them, can you experience what I'm about to experience? After all, he just told them for the third time that he's going to suffer and die and rise again. And their response to that was, yeah, no problem. We can do that. Sure. Which, if anything, says to us that they haven't been listening at all to what he's been saying. After spending three years with him by this point, they really didn't have a clue as to what was going on. And so it's no wonder that the gospel writer Mark goes on to tell us that when the other disciples heard what James and John asked for, they became indignant. Of course they would be indignant. Who wouldn't be? And actually, maybe they felt that way because of at least one of two reasons. Maybe they were so disgusted with James and John for being so arrogant as to ask for these special positions of honor. Or maybe the rest of the disciples were upset with themselves that they didn't think first of asking for those positions of honor. In either case, the disciples' view of greatness so different from God's view of greatness. Here's what greatness isn't. Greatness isn't self-promotion. Greatness isn't self, is not self-centeredness. Greatness is not self-importance. Greatness has nothing to do with power or position. It's not status or significance. It's not title or talent. It's not about the grades you get in school, although the grades you get in school are important. Greatness is not how much you have in your retirement account, although how much we have in our retirement accounts is important. Greatness is not our possessions that we accumulate. It's not about the accomplishments we've achieved. It's not about how much playing time you get on the court or the field rather than standing on the sidelines or sitting on the bench. Greatness is not about what somebody else says about you on social media. None of that is what greatness is. Instead, greatness is if anyone wants to be first among you, he must be the very last, Jesus says, and servant of all. That's greatness. Greatness is service. Greatness is considering someone else before yourself. Greatness is a willingness to sacrifice for the sake of somebody else. Greatness is selflessness, which isn't thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. You see, we may want celebrity status in life but Jesus wants us to have servant status. Jesus says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's greatness. Because after all, Jesus just said to the disciples that the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of others and suffer. That means he will be killed. He also said that following that, he will rise again. And so that means that Jesus offers his life as a sacrifice in exchange for our lives. He takes your place on the cross. He transfers all of your sin and guilt, all of my sin and guilt to himself. He suffers the pain and punishment that your sins and my sins deserve. So Jesus died your death. Jesus paid your debt. He forgives our sins. He loves you unconditionally. He promises you heaven. And every single day of your life, Jesus offers you a second chance and a new beginning. Isn't that 
what greatness is? You know, I think in life we can so easily get things all turned around. It's not about power or position. No, greatness is something else. Jesus says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and servant of all. And that's who Jesus was for you. And that's greatness. Maybe that's hard for us to keep all of that in perspective these days because we live in a culture where people are so quick to po- criticize whatever position you have or so quick to cancel you as a person. And maybe that causes us to counter back or maybe that causes us to disengage with them and not want to be involved at all. Or maybe it's all the more reason to demonstrate what we heard from the prophet Micah this morning. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's greatness, Jesus style. And that is what truly makes a difference in the world when the people of God demonstrate that. It's what Jesus did for you. He became your servant. And in order for Jesus to be seen in our lives, that's what he calls us to be for one another that people would see how great Jesus is from you because Jesus is the one who is truly great. In his name, amen.